One of the themes of this podcast series on the Mexican Dirty War is that historical narrative is fluid. Thinking about the past in terms of set, static events and people who already lived and thus have no causal impact on the present, that's a surefire way not just to misunderstand the history involved, but also just to kind of miss the point. Because the study of history is imperfect, and it's open for interpretation due to the fact that it happened in the past. That's exactly why historical narrative is fluid and not set in stone. There's always going to be new historical information that comes to light. There's always going to be new discoveries being made, new documents or conversations uncovered, new perspectives to look at things through, especially as humanity becomes more advanced. And these new avenues of historical research are naturally going to change how we view the past and why we view the past the way that we do. History is forgotten and remembered. It is interpreted and reinterpreted. It is set in stone and yet always changing. In this way, it's useful to look at history as memory. Imperfect, unreliable, yet central to identity and maybe the most important thing we have, both as individuals and as societies. I think the Mexican Dirty War is a great example of really all of these things that we've been discussing here in this series, especially this idea of historical narrative being fluid and our understanding of events changing as time goes on. Historian Elaine Carey has a paper where she points out this idea reminding us that a lot of what we know about the Mexican Dirty War only came out after a post-2000 investigation after the PRI finally lost power in Mexico. But as she points out, the connection between truth and fulfillment isn't always one-to-one. Talking about the final stages of the Dirty War, she says, quote, In 2006, Carrillo Prieto released a final report at the end of Fox's term of office. It documented 12 massacres, 120 extrajudicial killings, 800 forced disappearances, and 2,000 acts of torture against detainees. The release of the report remains rife with controversy, including censorship, notwithstanding recognition of crimes and the work to produce the report that brought together scholars, activists, and bureaucrats, the office of the special prosecutor was abandoned further shortly after the end of Fox's term of office. The cases against De La Bereda and Nazar Haro were halted in 2006, and they were released from house arrest. Of the three presidents responsible for the dirty war, the only living survivor was Echeverria, but his case was thrown out on March 26, 2009. As Rosario Ibarra de la Piedra, the mother of Jesus Piedra Ibarra, declared, it was business as usual in Mexico. Mexico's Pinochet moment never materialized. While the truth emerged in the final report issued by Carrillo Prieto, a widespread truth commission and forum for public reconciliation never took place, leaving an open wound that civil society continues to organize to address. The inability of the state to address the crimes of the past adds to the nation's duress during this period of heightened violence and increased militarization under President Felipe Calderón Hinojosa, further exacerbating a crisis within the human rights community and those who report the truth. In turn, the numbers of walking victims and survivors continues to grow alongside those who are too afraid to grieve for their lost loved ones. The failure of the state to properly address the past, compounds citizens' distrust in the government, the police, and armed forces. An unanswered, anguished past ensures that memories will only intensify to showcase Mexico's lack of transparency, democracy, and human rights. End quote. In other words, Kerry is taking our argument a step further here by saying that governments and societies who don't reckon with the nuances and complexities of historical narrative and collective memory will eventually be replaced by ones who do. Governments that don't address the crimes of the past usually don't function well, maybe even being replaced by ones who do.
But if all of that seems a little bit top-down and abstract, it should be remembered that the impact of the dirty war is really felt by the people who experienced it directly. Donna Monica was a peasant woman whose husband was abducted and disappeared during the dirty war in the 1970s. She talked about the psychological impact and really the psychological terror that she experienced as a result, saying, quote, Many years ago, in 1974, soldiers took my husband. I have not heard anything from him since. I don't know why they took him. They thought that he had to do something with the armed guerrilla movement of Lucio Cabanas. Times were ugly back then, very hard. Soldiers came to my village and took away the people. They set up their headquarters in my house and took all my animals. After they took my husband, I asked everywhere about him, but they never told me anything. I fight still today that they tell me what happened to him. We went to the city lots of times, to the protests. We suffered hunger and cold, and they didn't tell us anything. We are poor, so they don't listen to us. Sometimes people ask me why I didn't marry again, or why I didn't go away. And I tell them no, because I don't know if my husband is dead. Maybe one day he will return to the village. For me, he is not dead, because I never threw dirt on his grave. End quote there does seem to be a double terror here in that not only is this person a victim of state terror, but there's also just a lack of closure and an inability to move on in life. This person and thousands like her never found out the truth, never really knew if their loved ones would be returned or not. And obviously this is going to have psychological impacts for generations. Now, it's probably obvious why this is the case, but historian Sylvia Carl gives a breakdown of what makes this so tough. She says, quote, For the relatives of the disappeared, this power and domination over bodies is a cruel form of psychological violence. It results in the denial of four important cultural categories that are related to ritual performance in every society. Denial of bodies for example, of any knowledge about the location of relatives, be they alive or dead, denial of mourning, an important psychological process that is denied, since it is impossible to mourn without knowing if the person to be mourned is dead or alive, provoking thus a permanent state of liminality, denial of mortuary rituals, i.e. the structuring of the world of the living and the dead, denial of memory sites, there is no place where to think of, visit, or talk in a symbolic way to the relative. End quote. Again, this can all seem like a somewhat academic approach to grief and terror, but sometimes it's useful to break it down and really understand why events like the Dirty War are so devastating and what it means for real people to have all their aspects of grief taken away. And as Sylvia Carl points out in this paper, there are a lot of questions about justice in these types of scenarios. How do the victims achieve justice? How does society attempt to make things right? What role and responsibility do all of us have in this process? And what does making things right look like? Is that even possible? There have been arguments in Mexico, society and politics for practical and fungible elements of justice, things like reparations and financial compensation to surviving victims and their families. Nothing like this has ever ended up happening, on a large scale at least, so it's probably a moot point, but the question of how to help and how to help victims cope remains valid. Some victims like to tell their stories and want them to be told, but others cope simply by silence as resistance. Donna Fidencia, wife of a disappeared victim of the Dirty War, said, quote, First they started to come to the village, the Human Rights Commission. They wanted facts and facts and facts. And then one day I told them, no, not anymore. Get out, I said. You are not doing anything anyway for us, and so what for? I didn't tell them anything anymore. Why? Because one gets angry that they are only asking and asking, and then nothing changes. End quote. So there are people who feel 
on top of all the grief and the tragedy as if their stories are being exploited to some extent when they have to relive the trauma over and over again and then nothing ever happens. Historian Sylvia Carl talks about this, saying, quote, For many of the marginalized victims in the communities of Adiac, silence and refusal to speak is an act of resistance. It is a strategy to handle the silence of the transition regime about the whereabouts of their disappeared family members. End quote. What makes this even more sad is that just as victims of events like the Dirty War learn to be skeptical and not trust and have to cope on their own, the flip side of that coin is also true. Governments and state entities learn that these tactics of psychological terror can be effective, especially if they are never held accountable. Many historians have pointed this out about all kinds of events in history, but it's also true here. Many of the military leaders and government officials who were involved in the early killings and massacres and the dirty psychological terror were also involved in the student massacres of 1968 and 1971. Many of the people involved there learned that violence and state terror works and they were then involved in the next terrible event and so on and so forth. Many historians point out that a lot of the tactics in the Dirty War seem pretty familiar to those with knowledge of the modern Mexican drug war, where death and violence and disappearances number in the tens of thousands over the past four decades or so, and victims are left with what one paper I read called chronic ambiguity. Historian Sylvia Carl says, quote, the chronic ambiguity is again affecting thousands of families of the disappeared in Mexico. As in the past, the Mexican government continues to deny any responsibility for the crimes, spreading a discourse that relates every murder, every case of disappearance, and every exhumation of mass graves to organized crime. Within these spaces of cruelty, uncertainty, and fear, families of the disappeared are fighting for the rehumanization of the forgotten. The invisibilized and criminalized disappeared, both past and present. It is they who keep a crucial counter-memory alive, who permanently dissent in response to the official discourse of denial and silencing, and who deposit their own historical truth into Mexican collective memory. End quote. To circle back to the opening of this episode, the way that people live with history and deal with this idea of chronic ambiguity opens the door to the idea of history as a ghost or history as a memory. The complex feelings, emotions, and memories of the Mexican Dirty War were felt by people who were carrying on the legacy of centuries of turbulent Mexican history. Non-linear, almost like cyclical history, but not quite. The same ideas and feelings cropping up across time periods. Memories of violence and injustice lingering, only to be given form and feel later on in a slightly different way. History as a memory. Mm -hmm. 